This is a Founding Media podcast. Welcome to Defense Innovation from Tanks to Teleportation. I'm your host, Dan Dillard. In this series, we explore the intersection of technology, business, and national security with the Defense Innovation Unit, part of the U.S. Department of Defense, and key partners in this effort to grow the nation's innovation base. In this episode, we pull back the curtain and learn more about the importance of technology, specifically commercial technology, to our nation's security. We're joined by Zach Walker, the DIU Texas lead, and Rachel kolesnikoff Lindsay, a program manager and director of organizational development for DIU. We'll learn more about why leveraging commercial technology is important for the Department of Defense and how DIU coordinates with private companies to acquire the newest technology. Here are Zach and Rachel to explain more. Zach and Rachel, thank you for being on the show. I'm really excited to kick off this new podcast, Defense Innovation from Tanks to Teleportation. Uh, Zach and I have been chatting about this for the last few weeks now and just found it fascinating to take a peek into the, how the Department of Defense works and more importantly, how Main Street gets to work with the DOD, uh, both on innovation, technology, and speed. But before we get there, I do want to talk a little bit about your background. So Zach and Rachel, let's start by, out by discussing a little bit about your background and how you both got involved with the DIU. Zach, let's start with you. Great. Thanks, Dan, for hosting. Uh, I'm Zach Walker. I'm a major in the Air Force Reserve, currently full-time with DIU. Um, I've been in DIU since the end of 2016. And for me, this has been the end of a really remarkable journey in the U.S. government. Um, I enlisted in the Texas Army National Guard after 9-11 when I was 18. Um, and I had an opportunity to work in the Army and the Air Force. I did some time at the Pentagon, uh, NSA, CIA, Iraq, Afghanistan. I've just been very, very fortunate in my time in the last 18 years to see a big part of the U.S. government and the Department of Defense and how we operate. And I've seen many, many places where technology has not worked as well as it probably should. So when I had an opportunity to come to the Defense Innovation Unit, I knew without a doubt I had to jump on it. And it was for me an opportunity to try to fix some of the things I had seen over my career. And it's been a tremendously rewarding experience so far. Very cool. Thank you. Rachel? Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for having us today. I really appreciate it. My name is Rachel kolesnikoff Lindsay. I am active duty U.S. Air Force. I'm currently a major, and I have been at the Defense Innovation Unit since October of 2017. Um, I actually had two Air Force parents, which is a lot of what inspired me to do ROTC while I was in university at MIT. I did material science and engineering for my undergrad and then my master's before going into active duty. And it was a very different career path than the majority of my friends from college that all went into the tech sector or to these startups or even founding their own startups directly out of college, which was so different than where I went, which was the Air Force Research Labs to do basic level research for the government. Uh, after that job, I was stationed in Madrid, Spain, which was fantastic. And then I went to Los Angeles Air Force Base, where I had the good fortune to work in rocket launch and sending up Atlas V rockets for three years, which to me touches on one of my favorite parts about the Air Force, that they continue to give me these jobs that I feel like I am dramatically underqualified for, but then they give me the right resources and tools to be able to learn the skills that I need to really excel in the job that I'm in. And so as my time was coming to a close at Los Angeles Air Force Base, I learned about the Defense Innovation Unit up outside San Francisco and was immediately drawn to the mission that it was pairing the Department of Defense with these small companies, these startups, and these technology firms that the De Department of Defense had never done business with before. And so having so many friends that had been in that industry, I was so drawn to being there, even if it was on the other side of it. And it has been so interesting to see things from the government customer side of you and be able to work with very similar technologies. That's so cool. I love hearing the backgrounds of different guests and the paths that they've taken. I just think it's completely fascinating. I do want to jump into the Department of Defense, um, just just for the audience purposes to uh, 
understand a little bit more. I, I imagine that when people hear those words, it means different things to different people. Like it's such a huge organization. My imagination always goes to uh, Hollywood and the picture of the Pentagon, all this Hollywood programming that we've had. But I know it's much more than that. Since you both have worked uh, with the Department of Defense, can you give us potentially your viewpoint on what the DOD is? So the Department of Defense is so much larger than I realized when I first joined the Air Force that it encompasses everything that the Secretary of Defense oversees. So it falls under the president to the Secretary of Defense, and it is all functions of the government that are related either to national security or to the military services. So it's the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps, and then also all of our national security agencies as well that all fall under a a very large Department of Defense that does so much more than just... uh, the things that you tend to read about in the news or, or the soldiers that you picture when you think about the military. Uh, and so it's been very interesting to be a part of it. Really cool. Zach, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, just to second what Rachel said, it is completely astonishing the size of the Department of Defense and just the varied things that it does. So when you think about humanitarian response, even when it comes to the current situation now with this coronavirus, the DOD is playing a huge part in providing resources and guidance to support civil authorities in that response. At the same time, of course, you also have organizations like the NSA that's doing crazy intelligence and cyber warfare kind of things. You've also got organizations like the Defense Innovation Unit that's working with commercial technology, which may not at all be related to any of that, or it may. Um, it, it's astonishing what the breadth is of of what the DOD does. It's a little bit of everything. Well, wow, that's just really incredible. It just kind of opens my mind from that picture of the Pentagon to like really what it, what it entails. And again, that's just two viewpoints. But as with any l- large organization, typically the larger an organization gets, sometimes it impedes growth or innovation. I mean, I see that all the time with, with companies. And so let's, why don't we just talk about the reason for Defense Innovation Unit? Zach? Sure. So the the main issue is that it's extremely difficult for the Department of Defense to get the technology that we need for national security. Um, I will never forget my first day at the NSA, standing outside. I was so excited. It was outside of that big glass black building. It it we couldn't imagine what it would be like on the inside. It had to be just stuff from the movies, right? I had seen the movies, Enemy of the State, James Bond movies, right? It had to be just like that, right? So you go inside and it's like 1984, but not the George Orwell book. It's it's literally 1984, like carpet from the 80s, uh, cubicles that probably haven't seen much outside of 1980s technology. It's, it's really surprising that for a Department of Defense that has such a massive budget, that has such critical missions, like I mentioned from virus response all the way to, of course, fighting and winning the nation's wars, it's amazing how hard it is for the DOD to get technology. And again, it, it, we're not talking tanks necessarily. We may be talking teleportation, of course, if that's out there, but things as simple as email. And, and this, this recent crisis really hit home it for a lot of people, how hard it is to use technology that is custom-made. Again, the DOD is known as what's called a monopsony, where you have a single buyer. And in no situation do you get a good deal if you have a single buyer for something. And so the Defense Innovation Unit and other organizations like it were born to try to to cross that gap, to to bring in commercial technology that is better than what the DoD has. And we're not talking a little bit better, but we're talking like orders of magnitude better for much, much better prices, much better terms, and really just bring us up to a level that probably all of our listeners would expect DoD is playing on. But in reality, for many, many reasons that we can get into later, we we just aren't. Rachel, what about you? I couldn't agree more with what Zach said. It it really is true that the government used to have everything procured for them personally, and they used to be the only buyers of a lot of technology. And now we just are realizing that the DOD does not need to build bespoke technology for each and every one of our needs. We'll always have a need for things where we are the monopsony and we are the only customer, things like aircraft carriers, certain types of helicopters, things like that. But 
in a lot of technology areas, there are commercial companies out there that are building technology that could absolutely fulfill DoD needs in exactly the form factor that it's already in or something very close to it. And that's where the Defense Innovation Unit comes in to be able to really do that pairing of recognizing where commercial technology is available that can fulfill a DOD need for an upgrade or for a new technology altogether. I had never thought of it that way, but it puts it into perspective for me. Um, since it works that way, obviously, it's in all our best interest then to find solutions for national security uh, quickly in this ever-evolving world and dynamic. Um, so that brings me to the next question. What does DIU look like, like location-wise, who works there, et cetera? Sure. So the Defense Innovation Unit was stood up uh, just over four years ago, going on five years, actually. And we have four different locations, Silicon Valley, where I'm located, Austin, Texas, where Zach is, Boston, and also the Pentagon office. We focus on five different portfolio areas, which are artificial intelligence, autonomy, cyber, human systems, and space. Uh, the only one there that may not be directly clear is human systems, and that's everything that makes the experience better for the warfighter, whether that is medical technology, um, smaller battery packs for them to be able to transport things more easily, and anything else under the sun that you can think of. Within those five different portfolio areas, we also have teams that are engaged directly on the defense side to be able to scout across all services, all military services, and all agencies to really understand what those needs are. And then a commercial engagement team that looks at what commercial technology is available across each of those spectrum. And not only are they involved with companies, they're also involved directly with venture capital firms to understand where they're investing currently, where they see the trends going, and understand the market analysis that's already taking place on the private side of the house. Got it. Got it. Uh, Zach? So the real magic about DIU is when you walk into an office, it does not look at all like a military organization. People are not in uniform. We're in locations that people would want to be. So, of course, Rachel's office is in the heart of Silicon Valley. My office works in downtown Austin in Startup Accelerator. Boston is in Charles Park, which is right by MIT and just really that heart of innovation in, in New England. And these organizations, it, it's like a commercial organization that works for the Department of Defense. And I think that's something that people don't necessarily realize how important it is for the Department of Defense to have an approachable organization like DIU that we know is mandated to be that liaison with industry. So if you are an investor, if you're a startup, even if you just want to help national security and you don't entirely know exactly what that looks like, going to a DIU office or emailing us or going to our very simple, easy to navigate website at diu.mil, you can find out how to get involved with us and contribute in ways that look a lot more like what you've done in the private sector or in academia, and much less like what you may think of, going back to your earlier comment about the Pentagon and the movies. <laughs> well, one word that I caught you said there is approachable. And I think that's a lot of times whenever one thinks about the Department of Defense, just the way Hollywood has portrayed it, it's like, wow, there's this impenetrable force and you don't deal with it. And I would imagine that a lot of startups and other businesses don't think about that because they just feel like it might be uh, not approachable. But here is the DIU that is approachable and kind of helps be that liaison. So, so I really, really like that. What are some of the impressive uh, solutions and capabilities maybe that you've witnessed while you've been there through the DIU? It's been really neat to see just the variety of solutions that DIU's worked on, different kinds of companies as well. The uh, project I was involved in was a cybersecurity project. We called it Voltron. And there was this idea that there had been a really remarkable demonstration of a certain kind of cyber technology. And there wasn't a clear way to get that into the DoD. And in fact, it's, it's a story that we hear time and time again. The company that demonstrated this technology was approached by what we say several adversaries to the United States and essentially given a blank check and the US Department of Defense was nowhere to be found, right? Because that's not how it works, right? If just because someone has a great piece of technology or a great commercial product, it doesn't mean that we can use it in the DOD, which goes back to why DIU was established. 
Um, so the cyber project was really remarkable in the sense that we were able to go from our initial competition to awarding a multi-million dollar contract in just about a month. And for anyone that's ever worked with government contracting or acquisitions, that, that, se- that probably sounds illegal or impossible. And even for people that have worked in big companies, I mean, my, my wife works for a huge tech company. They don't necessarily move that much faster. To be able to move in a month is something that's really special. So the cyber project, um, we've done some really interesting things as well in artificial intelligence, which again, it's AI, of course, it's very easy to be a buzzword, um, but there are very legitimate uses of artificial intelligence, especially when it comes to things like predictive maintenance, right? Moving away from time-based maintenance, change this filter every thousand miles, even though it may be good for every 5,000 miles, but the book says thousand, right? All the way to saying, well, can we use technology to figure out when we should replace parts different from when a book may say we, we need to. We're talking billions of dollars that we think could be saved by moving away from time-based to condition-based maintenance. Um, so we have projects there. And of course, Rachel can speak to some of the amazing stuff we're doing in commercial space. Um, but for a small organization like DIU to do everything from cutting edge cybersecurity to changing how the DUD does maintenance all the way to commercial space is is really remarkable. I couldn't agree more with Zach that it's so impressive to me, the breadth of projects that we take on. And he's right that my focus has been primarily space projects. And one that I have particularly enjoyed is an upgrade to an aging phased array radar. This phased array radar uh, looks up and does object detection through space um, and sees what's up there, is able to catalog it so we understand everything that is uh, in orbit. And it was built in the 70s. It has received very minimal upgrades since then. And I, I kid you not, I went and saw this radar in person. I have seen newer computer parts in museums than wow. what this radar is currently operating on. Um, it is impressive and not in the good way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so in a very similar timeline to what Zach discussed, they, the DOD partner brought the problem to our attention. We surveyed the market and understood that there really were great commercial options available for them to be able to upgrade the system. And we released the problem statement and we were able to award contracts within 60 to 90 days. Wow. Um, And then all of that prototyping work was complete within 18 months, which means that just in the span of my my time at DIU, I have both been able to start and end a project that will now transition to fully upgrade this radar system to be state of the art with what currently exists. We're, We're upgrading it to technology from this decade. And I was struck by another story that I saw recently about uh, the COBOL software that is Mm -hmm. still the underwriting software for all the unemployment websites across the nation. And that's why they have all been crashing because this software was never designed to be able to manage the magnitude. And it's so difficult to upgrade because COBOL, much like the code that... um, was used to write the software for the the radar system that I worked with, went mm-hmm. extinct around the time that I learned to read chapter books in the early 90s. And so wow. with that, of course, there are very few people around that still know how to, to code and better yet to fix code written in that language. And that's why it's so important that we modernize these systems so they can continue to serve as well. So it sounds like what you've been saying is you're more like a matchmaker. DIU is more like a matchmaker between the DOD and... Uh, companies that are out there and technologies that are out there, is it equally as important for as large as the Department of Defense is to know about the DIU as it is perhaps companies that are out there? Zach? Absolutely. And I would say that's really a big focus of ours. So for us, we solve problems more so than work with solutions, right? And it's a subtle nuance, but it's critically important. We really want to make sure that we're solving the right problem. Right. I, I, I have this kind of a joke, but it's it's happened, so it's not much of a joke of generals that say that they need artificial intelligence, right? To which the response is, okay, well, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Because if you apply artificial intelligence to something that isn't really a problem, you're not going to solve that problem. And I know it 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 sounds kind of silly when I explain it, but when you think about that in a lot of different ways, just having commercial technology 
is only part of the problem. You actually have to have a way, you have to have a problem to solve and you have to have a responsible structured approach to solve that problem. And that's where DIU comes in. And that's where working with Department of Defense partners is so important to make sure that we do understand the problem that can be solved. In many ways, providing translation services, because as, again, as Rachel was saying, if people are used to working with a radar built in the 70s, they probably haven't been exposed to like DevOps pipelines, right? Or, or anything that has been around in the last 10 or 20 years. And that's what's so important for DAU to have folks like myself that come from the department. We have many people that come directly from industry that understand the terminology, they understand how it all comes together. So then when we work with DOD partners, we help them understand, yes, you have a problem that can be solved. It is something that can transition into what is called programs of record. Basically think about that as we don't wanna just do a prototype as Rachel was saying, we don't wanna just show that this radar can do something really cool. We wanna make sure that in 10 years, it's still doing that, right? And that's also a very difficult challenge in the Department of Defense. So we solve a problem, we make sure it transitions. And then of course, when industry comes in, we turn to industry and say, hey, these are our problems. If you can solve it, let us know. And within about 60 to 90 days, you can have a contract, which is really, really speedy in Department of Defense land. So Zach talked a lot about the defense side. It's also so important for that matchmaking to be done on the commercial side as well, because a lot of these companies have never worked with the Department of Defense de be Department before their contract with DIU. And so making sure that we have terms and conditions in our contracts that are very friendly to these small companies that allow them to maintain as many of their intellectual property rights as possible while still guaranteeing a good product to the government, making these uh, contracts severable just in case the company pivots and decides to go a different direction and it no longer makes sense to work with us or vice versa, that either of us can say, hey, thank you so much. This has been great, but this is the right place for us to walk away. Um, and having them understand that the Department of Defense doesn't always mean 500 page contracts and entire teams of lawyers that need to review everything or be able to do all of the reporting that's required in order for you to comply with the contract. These simple contract mechanisms that we use make it a lot more approachable for small companies. So I was always really impressed by how our corporations are able to make those kind of shifts and in turn benefit the nation as a whole. You bring up a really good point about that, because it is astonishing what companies have done in the past to retool their production lines to make military parts. I think I read something about how we can make like seven planes a day in World War II, which is just staggering. What's really important to know, though, is we're not asking companies to become defense contractors. I think that's something that's really important distinction. We want companies to still be commercial companies. We just want to accelerate what they're doing by having the Department of Defense as a customer. So you'll sell us what you're selling in a Fortune 100, maybe make some changes, right? I mean, we do need some slight modifications typically, but we are not looking to turn you into a defense contractor. And I think that's a really important distinction. Certainly we need defense contractors. They are absolutely critical to what we do. As Rachel mentioned earlier, if you need an F-35 or a tank or an aircraft carrier, right? We need the traditional defense industrial base for that. But that's not to say that it's mutually exclusive and bringing in what we call non-traditionals, again, just companies, right? Companies that are making things to solve problems today. If you're solving a problem for a Fortune 500, you can probably solve that problem for the DoD. The other real benefit to the government of being a customer as opposed to the only customer for a lot of these companies is the fact that the company has to keep pace with commercial and accelerate their own technology to continue to advance it so that the entire market still wants to buy the technology and the DOD benefits from those upgrades that they'll be doing to, to cater to their entire commercial base, not just us. And we can be design partners too with a company. And I think that's really important as well. Um, one of the companies I worked with was really early stage. So we would call it seed stage in the, in the terminology. Because they worked with us, it meant that we could get their technology into the hands of people at Cyber Command, in the Air Force, in the Army, and actually using it every day and providing amazing feedback. In fact, the highest ranking civilian 
at U.S. Cyber Command said that the technology that this company had was one of the most important things our nation is doing. And for a seed stage company to have that kind of traction in the DoD, to have that kind of design partner who can then tell them, we well, yeah, do this, do that. We don't like this. We don't like that. When they were raising what was called a Series A round, right? I mean, they the people that I spoke with on those calls could not comprehend that a seed stage company had that kind of traction already in the DoD. So what it meant for the company was that they could negotiate the kind of terms that they wanted because they had already unlocked access to such a huge market that's almost impossible to break into if it weren't for organizations like DIU. So we talked about some of the challenges. Uh, Rachel mentioned the challenge of this telescope that looks at, it was a telescope satellite, satellite that looks at uh, old technology that we're using. What are some of the other challenges that you know one could think about we're facing now? Oof, there are so many out there. It is impossible to put a finger on all of them, but the DoD really does own a lot of systems that were state of the art when they were built and are in very much so a need of an upgrade now. However, I think the real challenge is making sure that, as Zach alluded to, that this commercial technology is able to proliferate across the Department of Defense and have them really understand the mindset that we don't need to create everything ourselves and that a lot of the technology that we need can come directly from the commercial base. One odd aspect of being in the military is almost everybody that is in the military have, has never worked on the private sector. And that also means that we've never dealt with any technology outside of the military technology to really understand just how quickly and capable the commercial markets are on a lot of fronts. And that's a lot of what DIU does is helping them understand in exactly the example that Zach gave that there is so much that these small companies are capable of, even from their earliest phases. I would say to double click on that, the speed is something that the DoD mm -hmm. really is slow is starting to get a hold of, but it's so critical for us to be successful moving forward. If you're writing software and you're using Agile processes, you're continuously improving, continuously deploying code. In the DoD, I'm going back to our earlier comment, if you have a COBOL system sitting on an island somewhere, right, you're probably not using Agile practices to, to improve it. And even if we get the best technology that the commercial sector has to provide, it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to integrate it and we're going to be able to use it and update it. Um, the national security strategy talks about this. Um, the national defense strategy talks about this in that it doesn't necessarily matter if you get new technology, the challenge is in integrating it and adapting it to how you operate. And I think that's a really important piece that is missing in a lot of these discussions is, oh, well, we need the best cloud technology or we need the best AI technology. We need the best commercial space tech. And that's important, but I would offer the majority of the challenge is doing just what Rachel did in her projects. How do you actually get it integrated, get it delivered, get it to where you're getting some kind of update cycle that makes sense with industry so that the Department of Defense can continuously be moving forward and continuously improving. It's very, very hard for us. In fact, our system was really purpose-built to not do that. And so that's why you need organizations like the Defense Innovation Unit, because we have the mandate to try and move us in that direction. Okay, uh, question for you both. What's the one piece of advice you would offer both leadership at the DOD that wants to work or explore working with private sector firms? And then also take that same question, apply it to private sector that wants to work with DOD. Oh, man. Uh, let's see. For me, I would offer that leadership has to understand that they need to move at the speed of commercial if they really want to engage these private sector solutions, that these companies need contracts and revenue this quarter, as opposed to sometime next fiscal year. Uh, and beginning that work, not being afraid to prototype, don't try and eat the entire elephant at once, take a small portion of the problem and do incremental solutions along the way to make sure that the problem really or that the solution really does fit the needs of the problem incrementally. And particularly if you're able to deliver that incremental solution and test it out piece by piece, you are much more likely to have a fully capable system when it's all done. And not just that, have small upgrades along the way that benefit at each step of the process. My advice to 
DOD leadership after having done this for about four years is that this innovation thing, like it's not a fad. It's not going away. And even if the organizations were to go away, the need to bring in commercial technology to make the Department of Defense a better force is, is not going anywhere. And so trying to institutionalize what we're doing, right? Um, doing something that's been done differently, looking at the numbers, looking at the metrics, seeing what works and what doesn't work, and then putting it into DOD code or policy or whatever you want to call it, that has to be done. Again, this, this need is not going to go away um, even if all of these defense innovation organizations were to go away tomorrow. And I think for companies, what I would say is going back to the start of a conversation, it is almost incomprehensible just how much stuff the DOD does, right? From again, virus response to fighting wars, to sending stuff up into space. The DOD does a little bit of everything. And to that end, there are innumerable ways to work with the DOD. And if you're interested in working with the Department of Defense, just do the research to understand what may work the best for your company, the best for your, your growth path, and also the best for you as someone that wants to help national security, right? The DOD is a massive organization, but we're composed of many, many different components that each have a little bit different way of doing business. I would, I would challenge anyone to find a way that doesn't fit with their way of doing business either as a company or as an individual, right? There's something for everyone in the Department of Defense. Thank you both. I learned so much today and I know that our audience did as well. I just want you to thank you both for taking the time to chat with us today. This was just really informative and I look forward to our next episodes. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much, Dan. This has been great. Thanks again, Zach and Rachel for helping us get a better understanding of the exciting work that DIU is doing. It really does affect us all. That's it for this installment of Defense Innovation from Tanks to Teleportation. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with a friend. And we'll be back soon with more about the Defense Innovation Unit efforts. Defense Innovation from Tanks to Teleportation is created in partnership between the U.S. Department of Defense and Founding Media. To learn more about the Defense Innovation Unit, please visit the links in our show notes. Thank you for listening.